This is in Prism. So now you see the slides. Is that working for you? Yep, yeah, perfectly. Okay. Yeah, great. Oh, so thanks a lot uh, for inviting me to to give a small presentation here on um, uh, asthma control and asthma severity. I think it's a difficult time for these kind of presentations, and um, it's it's difficult for all of us. I see the numbers from from the UK with coronavirus. Uh, all my best for you guys over there. It's uh, pretty striking what you what mortality rates you have. So I wish you all the best for the future. Um, my name is Eckhard Hamelmann. I'm a pediatric uh, pneumologist and allergist uh, from Germany. Uh, I'm working at the uh, Bielefeld Hospital uh, Children's Center at Bethel. And um, I will give a talk. Um, this is my conflict of interest. I, I gave uh, um, presentations and I had a report for several companies. But um, I, uh, I hope that my present Present, my today's presentation is uh, is free for all these conflicts, and I will give you a fair talk about um, asthma. Um, as I said, we we are all talking about coronavirus. We all look at the numbers. We we reaching, I think, uh, close to one million people now infected with corona. But um, so sometimes it's good to see it. Other diseases as well. We know that. Still, obstructive diseases are um, one of the major threats in, in the world. We have 230 million people with asthma. We have uh, around 60 million people with COPD. And um, the forecast says that um, COPD uh, will be the third leading cause of death worldwide by 2030. Why is that important when we talk about pediatric asthma? Because we know by now that there is a close link between uh, pediatric asthma pediatric lung function problems and the development of uh, later chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases in adults. So this is just one uh, particular uh, paper showing this um, uh, this combination. I would give you in the next slides uh, some examples for this. Uh, first of all, this is um, a slide showing um, the development of lung function over time. So for the first 30 years, um, a maximum of FE1 um, uh, levels and uh, the, the, the top graph shows the normal development of lung function reaching a maximum around 18 to 20 years and then uh, having a plateau with a slow decline over the next years or decades. So um, uh, when you when you make a, a theoretical um, um, yeah, distribution of lung function development, you can say that uh, you can have uh, an early decline when you reaching the the maximum level, but then you have an early decline earlier than after the plateau phase, and then you have uh, two other groups that theoretically can uh, develop with a reduced growth, where we you not reach the maximum de uh, uh, level of FE1, uh, and you have a plateau phase, or you have even a reduced uh, growth and an early decline as well. And especially these two groups uh, would normally meet the um, definitions of uh, that made by by Gold uh, for the for the COPD um, diagnosis stage two or stage three. So these are the the development these are the lung function trajectories that are closely linked to the development of COPD. And um, this leads over to these uh, very um, very significant data from the CAMP study that were published uh, a couple of years ago. Um, what they did here is uh, looking at the, the, the data from uh, the asthma children um, and were followed up for uh, nearly 30 years and compared to the percentiles of normal growth, um, uh, lung growth development. And um, so you see uh, with this percentile, this is normal growth development from a different uh, study of non-asthmatics where they uh, said so this is the percentiles of normal growth development over 30 years uh, looking at every one maximum rates and um, now looking at the camp data you had a, a percentage uh, of um, people 170 from from these uh, who met the trajectories for normal growth you had reduced growth uh, around 160 um, you see that this is a, a group where you from the beginning have reduced growth uh, you have normal growth at an early decline, and this number four, um, again, 176 um, patients have this um, meet the trajectories for reduced growth and early decline. 
And why is that important? Because 11% of all the patients in the, in the CAMP study uh, finally met the definition for COPD. And when you look at uh, these, um, the, 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 the two groups with the reduced growth, B and D, reduced growth or reduced growth and early decline, you see that 18% of all these patients having had moderate asthma uh, will finally meet the definition for COPD. Uh, another very um, significant uh, study is from the Tasmanian Longitudinal Health Study. We adopted this um, graph in our paper in PI, but the, the, the data are, I think, very significant. Uh, you see here, um, this is a birth cohort and with um, shows now for, for uh, several decades the development of lung function and in the group where you have an early below average, so this is a um, um, small grow, growth plus acceler accelerated decline, uh, meaning um, uh, de decreased growth and early decline, these patients will end up with 46% um, um, diagnosis of COPD. So what do we learn here? We have um, an early decline as a very important contributor for long-term deficit in lung function. This is um, definitely one of the main risk factors for the development of COPD. Um, and this is uh, something that we um, definitely need to uh, follow up closer uh, in, when, we, when we look at our patients. And uh, I think especially the long-term um, following up of lung function is, is something that we need to be very aware of. Uh, when we look at, um, at the theoretical development of adult COPD uh, beginning in early childhood, we can of course um, delineate some genetic problems, uh, genetic uh, predisposition of early wheeze, of early declining lung function on the one hand, and on the other hand we have um, genetic association with COPD uh, that arises later, but is already, um, of course, uh, can be uh, detected um, um, yeah, w w in the newborns because that is a, uh, that's a genetic risk. And um, these two genetic risk factors uh, combined with uh, environmental risk factors, first of all, of course, maternal smoking, then uh, the genetic um, um, or the, the family history of Maternal, uh, paternal asthma, and then the development of, um, development of childhood asthma or childhood wheeze, and of course, uh, early respiratory infections, as we just heard um, um, from Sajana. She, I think, made it really clear that RSV, rhinovirus, and other uh, infections are one of the major, major threats. All this now uh, contributes to reduced adult FEV1 trajectories and accelerated rate of decline in lung function, basically very uh, severe predisposing risk factors for the development of COPD. Professor, uh, sorry to interrupt. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you. Jolly good. We're having some difficulty hearing you, but I haven't had much of a moment to sort of just try and correct it. Um, I, I might ask that um, as it's such, a, such an important presentation, perhaps we might move over to just take this moment to move over to this to, and switch to f telephone audio, because that will guarantee a solid audio connection for everybody. Uh, it's quite data heavy, so we don't really want to miss anything. W would that be all right? Um, so would I need then uh, to, to go to the phone? It, so if you just grab a, reg you can leave your slides up, that's fine, we can see those absolutely perfectly. If you grab a regular telephone, your smartphone or a regular yeah. okay. Telephone, yep. Okay, and at the bottom left corner, it'll say uh, mute, and there's a little arrow next to it. If you click that arrow. Mm. Uh, Hang on a second, I don't see that at the moment. All right. you, you may need to, if, you're, if you alt and tab, or uh, hit escape on your slide okay. show, and we'll come back to it. I can do mute, mute. okay. Um, so next to mute, uh, there's a little arrow that points upwards, just click that. And then next to it, there's uh, an option that says switch to telephone audio. Can you see that? Oh, I think you might have muted yourself. Uh, hold on a second. Uh, let me unmute you there. Uh, okay, so you're, you're currently muted, but as long as you can hear me, um, once you've clicked that switch to telephone audio, it'll present you a box, which will give you a local telephone number. If you just click your the country in which you are, uh, click that country flag, and it will give you a telephone number to dial, 
And then all you do is input your meeting ID and your participant ID, and you'll come right back into the meeting on the regular telephone. Uh, thank you everybody for standing by. Thank you for your patience. I imagine uh, Professor Howellman is uh, currently just uh, switching over to phone audio at the moment. Okay, um, I, I may need to contact Professor Hamelman um, outside of Zoom just to make sure he's okay. If you guys don't mind standing by, we'll just, um, won't be terribly long. So do you hear me now? Yes, absolutely okay. perfectly, that's brilliant. Please do okay. continue. If you just go to full screen mode again, that's the one. And now we can see everything and we can hear you perfectly. Please do continue. Thank you ever so much. Okay. Thanks a lot. Sorry, guys, for this <laughs> interruption. It's a bit a technical uh, challenge here. Um, so what did we say? We, 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 um, we had this slide on here and uh, said there is this, um, this link between early lung function decline and the development of COPD later in life. And... Um, we said one of the, the unmet needs, uh, of course, is that we, uh, we need to um, uh, find ways uh, that we um, maybe use um, biologicals at earlier stages uh, than we do at the moment. At the moment, we only use uh, biological treatments for severe asthma and um, for the future. Uh, it would, of course, be wiser that we, that we treat asthma uh, in a more pathophysiologically related way uh, as early as possible uh, in the, with the goal to prevent deleterious long-term adverse uh, events um, or adverse uh, um, lung development later in life. At the moment, um, the goals um, in the asthma treatment is, uh, is shown here uh, from the, from the um, GINA guideline. We basically have two goals, um, uh, target the best possible control and target risk reduction. Uh, our best possible control, we normally measure with symptom, symptom load, uh, the, the daily use of uh, salbutamol or short-acting beta agonist um, reliever medications and uh, the daily and, uh, activities and, and uh, yeah, um, un undisturbed nights uh, for the children. This is basically what we look for acute control, but I believe that um, the, the other target uh, the risk reduction is even more important that we need to concentrate on future risk that we need to concentrate on stability and um, prevent um, long-term loss of lung function uh, because this is uh, so important for the for the um, long-term uh, outcomes of the patients and um, one of the um, the parameters that are that, that need to be followed up very closely is exacerbation rates uh, and exacerbations, um, basically. I switch over to this. Um, when we look at, uh, at control data from different countries, on, on the right side of the screen, you see uh, what, how many patients are really controlled or how, what is the percentage of uncontrolled asthma in different countries. You see that there's always a vast uh, uh, proportion of uh, patients that are not meeting really the um, criteria for good control or for, for partial control. So in Europe, for example, it's only uh, 50, uh, around 50% of patients um, that are controlled. So this is um, in, in uh, view of the vast number of patients who are affected by asthma, 
uh, this is, I think, um, the, the big threat that we need to uh, face, and that this is uh, the reason why we need to talk about what what can we do to better control asthma, what is um, to be done to um, address the risk domain in the long-term management. This is a paper uh, mostly written by Stan Seffler, who is last author in this paper, and I um, I show it here to you because I think it is uh, a paper uh, giving uh, a lot of details, information, uh, what, how, how can we address this, uh, the risk domain in, in this treatment? And uh, we put uh, down like 10 bullet points, uh, what we feel is uh, so important in the long-term treatment of asthma. Uh, again, we, we address the problem of reduced childhood lung function as one of the, um, the, the, the risk factors for development of later COPD. Uh, and this is independent of the development of asthma, basically. So the, the, the early, ch early child wheezing and early lung function uh, decline as an independent risk factor of COPD. Uh, then, of course, we um, summarized uh, the main risk factors for this uh, problem with the lung function. Uh, we, we, we had that. We covered that parental asthma, childhood asthma, several asthma attacks of wheeze. Um, pollutions and especially, of course, environmental tobacco smoke. Um, we we have at the moment already several biomarkers available. This is, uh, of course, very limited. We we should all measure IgE. We should all measure uh, eosinophil numbers in peripheral blood, uh, and we should, of of course, all measure pheno as possible as early as possible. And uh, we should measure lung function data as early as possible and uh, in a longitudinal way so that we can really find the, the patients and the children with uh, early decline or with um, reduced uh, lung function growth. Um, the gene signatures that we have at the moment are promising, but we, but we can't use them in the, in the daily practice. There's, there is not a, a really a, a genetic risk um, domain or we cannot use a, a, an easy test uh, to show what is the risk group of patients who have um, um, yeah, frequent exacerbations or, or are very um, have a high risk for the, the decline of lung function. What we know is that the, the best predictor for future exacerbation is the current exacerbation. This, is, this sounds pretty dumb, but I think it's really important that when we have patients who have or we have had several exacerbations in the last couple of months or in the last year. So this is the group that we really need to concentrate on. And uh, this is the group with the highest risk for the next exacerbation again. And we know that um, previous asthma attacks are the best predictor, as I said, uh, and that asthma attacks, um, when they are frequent, uh, they are highly associated with loss of fun lung function, the development of persistent or severe asthma and basically um, high morbidity and cost. Um, so the last, maybe is the most important for the today's talk, adequate asthma control reduces the risk of severe asthma attacks in children. So this reduces the risk for future asthma attacks, reduces the risk for the development of severe asthma and um, uh, for future loss of lung function. So this is our main goal that we have uh, adequate asthma control in our patients. This is just, um, uh, we can say a, a short confusogram. Uh, it, it, it's really small for you guys. It's, it's hard to read, but you don't need to read it. It's just giving you an impression of, of one of these algorithms. Uh, there are several around. This is um, a recent paper by, uh, by, by Stan and myself. Um, I would just want to point out, if you have a patient uh, where you have difficulties to, to achieve good control, good asthma control, or you have uh, several exacerbations in the in the in the um, uh, past. Uh, make sure first of all to ensure that the diagnosis is correct. Make sure that this is really asthma that we are talking about. And if it is asthma, if you can assure the diagnosis, uh, make sure um, to uh, have a good um, feeling about this is difficult to treat asthma or really severe asthma. Difficult to treat asthma, of course, is the the majority of these asthma patients. Um, because they have adherence problems, they have uh, comorbidities, uh, they have uh, tobacco smoke or whatever it is. Uh, so this is uh, really important to to first uh, find out what type of uh, 
difficult to ask to treat asthma you you have um, in phase and then if you have genuine CP asthma then you can uh, of course uh, move on to the next step try to classify the severity and type uh, really use the biomarkers that are available uh, have good lung function data available um, and then um, see what level of treatment you are and uh, try to find what kind of uh, inflammatory data you can achieve from this uh, patient and then uh, see if you can classify uh, the patient into one of the uh, one of the uh, few uh, endotypes that we can address in, in childhood is it an allergic endotype is it an eosinophilic endotype is it none of both uh, do we really see a lot of neutrophils in the in the lavage if we do a lavage and then of course uh, step number three Treat, uh, treat and prevent um, the patient. Um, when, when we look at the, the treatment cascades, this is, I think, the um, worldwide most known treatment cascade is from the, the GINA cascade. Every uh, country uses, of course, uh, its own algorithms and all asthma guidelines. Uh, we will, at the end of this talk, uh, talk about the British uh, Thoracic um, Society a guideline. This is the GINA guideline. And of course, you all know um, this, I guess. So this is for the patients 12 years of age and older. So when we do, when we go from the more moderate to the more severe patients, what can we do? We can use uh, medium dose ICS in combination with lava, or we can use high dose ICS and then use an add-on. Um, uh, other than lava, we can use teotropium. What, what I will talk uh, about teotropium later in more detail what what is it and what, why can we use it uh, so um, either teotropin or we can use um, leukotriene receptor antagonists and then uh, only when we reach step five and we really um, have still bad control with high dose ICS lava then we need to uh, first of all refer to a um, to a really good assessment um, if possible do a bronchoscopy uh, really make sure that this is asthma what we're talking about and then uh, we can um, add on therapy with geotropium add on therapy with anti-ige or anti-il5 and um, if um, if labeled in the country uh, where you treat the patients you can use anti-il4 receptor antagonists as well so this is basically uh, the option for the moment if you uh, treat patients um, below 12 years of age, so children 6 to 11 years. Uh, there is, um, of course, a more limited number of, of biologicals available for this age group. Uh, basically, it's anti-IgE. In Germany, you can use anti-IL5 in this age group as well, but I'm sure uh, you agree that we only have very few numbers of patients who have this really, really typical eosinophilic, non-allergic uh, type of, of, of asthma. In this age group um, and again here you can in the step four be before you referring to biologicals and you have a, a patient with bad control or uh, many exacerbations that is treated with medium dose ICS plus lava what can you do you can discuss at least if you should uh, use teotropium as well as an, um, a third controller that you can add uh, to your high dose ICS and lava uh, so this is a new option that we uh, can discuss uh, during this talk a bit more in detail. Um, just one short word to um, to the stepping up from step three to step four. If you have a patient on low dose ICS uh, lava or medium dose ICS uh, single, and you have a bad control, what can you do? I think uh, this is a very good paper um, uh, dealing with a, with a, a comparison uh, of this step up. Uh, what can you do? rather um, add lava or increase um, the, the inhaled corticosteroid uh, dose and basically in terms of CB exacerbation rate um, it's um, pretty much uh, the same if you use a combination of ICS lava or you uh, you have an increased ICS rate but um, if you look for asthma control data the combination of ICS lava a medium do medium dose ICS plus lava is more effective or better effective than uh, just uh, increasing the ICS dose, and I think this is the best paper uh, show, uh, really comparing these two different steps. Um, so now some words to towards the teotropium um, um, because it is a new drug that is available now for our uh, children with um, more severe asthma. 
um, I think it is important to have an idea what can it do, what can't it do. Uh, tier 2 opium is uh, now labeled and um, I show you some efficacy and safety data from, from um, the, the phase 3 studies. Um, this is now uh, labeled for 6 and 11 years. What is tier 2 opium? Tier 2 opium is a long-acting muscarinic receptor antagonist. Basically, it acts um, on the muscarinic type 3 receptor and it blocks um, the, the activation of this receptor by the acetyl uh, choline. This receptor is expressed by the smooth muscle cells in the lungs, um, among other cells. So uh, basically, by blocking this um, receptor, um, it blocks um, the ability to contract um, very similar to the short, short acting that you might use in, in the emergency care already for the for the last decades. So this is now a long-acting um, receptor blockade uh, that um, blocks the receptor for, for like 12 to 24 uh, hours. Um, this shows you the, the, the profile of the, the, the Teotropium Resumat um, development uh, program. And you, I think it's, it's very important that you look at the numbers of patients who who were investigated in this program, over 6,000 patients overall. Of course, um, the majority were uh, in, the, um, in the adult program, but still I show you uh, quite uh, high numbers. Um, and I, actually, I think this is the, uh, from, uh, in terms of numbers, the, uh, the biggest trial in um, adolescent and pediatric asthma patients uh, with the single drug that has been performed so far. Um, so you see we've, we've performed, uh, we, um, did four different trials, uh, two trials in the adolescent group, um, in the more severe um, patient group, and in the moderate severe patient group, and two trials in the pediatric group, one in the severe patient group, and one in the uh, moderate group. Um, so, as I said, in the in the uh, in the adolescent groups, we have the two two trials, two phase three trials, basically look into Teotropium, uh, what can it do for step four? If we have patients that are not uh, currently uh, good controlled, well controlled in step three with low dose or medium dose ICS or, con or the combination of medium dose ICS and LABA and um, the same um, for the, two, uh, the, the pediatric age group, six to 11 years, um, two phase three trials uh, for step four um, when you have bad control in step three, um, I don't want to show you all the these all these different um, trials. It would be a bit too time consuming and a bit boring, to be honest. So I just um, show you this um, uh, review paper uh, that we um, that we wrote about uh, these two uh, these four different trials. Again, Stan Safler as as the last author. Uh, this is an overview of the the four trials. Um, as I already explained, two trials in the adolescent group, two trials in the uh, pediatric age group. Um, for each age group, one in the moderate and one in this more severe age group. And the severity is defined by patients who are treated with at least medium dose ICS plus another two controllers or high dose ICS plus LABA. Uh, with an ACQ of uh, 1.5 or more, so not uh, um, not a good um, asthma control, and at least one exacerbation in the last 12 months. Um, they had uh, to had um, lung function rates uh, rates at inclusion between 70 and 90 percent of predicted FAV1. So basically, a pretty uh, pretty severe um, patient group indeed. This is. Um, the um, the summary slide of the efficacy data. Uh, now we group the patient into the moderate asthma patient group and the severe asthma patient group. So this is both pediatric and adolescent groups uh, in the uh, in the top and then the bottom. And uh, you see basically the primary endpoints of the trials. This is peak FEV1 and uh, trough FEV1. I'm I'm not sure. Can you do, do you understand me? I think you understand me, right? I hope you understand me. I'm not hearing anything. We we can hear you. Yep. You can hear you can hear me. Okay, that's good. 
I, I just wanted to make sure I, because it's so silent. <laughs> okay, yeah. um, then I can go on. Um, it's, it, it was so silent. Um, okay, uh, the, the primary endpoint of, of these studies always were the peak FEV1 and the trough FEV1, um, meaning the pre-bronchodilator and the post-bronchodilator uh, maximum FEV1 um, the study. So the, this is the peak FEV1 in the first three hours after uh, after the bronchodilator, um, and this uh, is the pre-bronchodilator FA1 maximum response. And uh, you see that, um, for example, in uh, in this group with the moderate asthma, you have an increase of uh, these uh, peak FA1 um, uh, lung function data of around 170 mil. And this is uh, this is quite quite remarkable if you know that. Um, 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 that uh, yeah, if you have, for example, an uh, um, solar uh, treatment, you you reach an um, an average increase of of fifty to sixty or seventy mils uh, in the very severe age group. So this is this is a very significant increase in the in the lung function data from uh, in the in all of these four um, four um, different groups that we studied, um, moderate and severe. Uh, pediatric and um, adolescent patients. I just want to show you as an ex example one study a bit closer. So this is the study in the children um, uh, with a severe sy symptomatic asthma. So these are children of 6 to 11 years of age uh, that meet the criteria of severe asthma that I explained before. So they all have severe symptomatic asthma um, and this is the primary endpoint, peak FEV1 uh, and you see um, the two different doses, uh, dose groups that were studied, 5 microgram versus 2.5 micrograms versus the placebo. And uh, the, there's the significant increase in the, in the FA1 of around 140 mils in, uh, in these patients. And this, is a, uh, this was a 24-week um, um, uh, study, the 12th um, at, um, and uh, the primary endpoint was measured at Week, 20, uh, week 12, uh, so this is the full analysis set for these patients. What I think is even more important are the data for the FEF 25 to 75. Um, why do I think this? Because I think this is reflecting a little bit better the um, bronchial um, dilation or the bronch bronchial responses in the, in the smaller airways. And here you see quite nicely um, a dose response curve again with the with the highest response in the five uh, microgram group, and um, quite impressive, I think, um, uh, yeah, um, increase in this in this lung function value versus the placebo group. Um, now, uh, coming back to the safety, I think this is very important for for the pediatrician who might use teotropin, who wants to, who is considering to use teotropin. Um, this is again from the review paper where we. Um, put the patients together, uh, six, uh, 260 patients treated with the 5 microgram uh, and 263 with the 2.5 microgram versus 270 patients in the placebo group. And uh, basically, to be honest, uh, you do not see a, a significant signal towards an, um, a safety problem um, uh, for the uh, teotropin. So we can say that uh, we um, have quite a safe drug uh, with a um, with, um, significant increase in lung function data um, we, that, that we can use. So this is the label in the UK now, let's be real respirmat, and this is important uh, that we use it, of course, at the moment only in the label. Let's be real respirmat is indicated as an add-on maintenance bronchodilator treatment in patients of eight, six years and older with severe asthma who experience one or more severe asthma exacerbations in the preceding year. And um, so the, the label varies, of course, by, by country, but this is the UK label. And uh, this is now the, my final slide. Uh, the, uh, the British Thoracic um, Society um, label, and I think um, Dr. Gupta wanted to address this because this is a very specific UK, uh, of course, algorithm. Uh, to be honest, in Germany, we would not treat our patients exactly according to this guideline, but Maybe this is good that that until now um, makes um, make a, makes a comment to this. Atul, please. 
thank you very much, Akhat. Um, I think the, the BTS guidelines, as I think most of the UK audience will be very familiar with, um, you start um, with the regular treatment with low dose of inhaled corticosteroids, add on to the initial or add on treatment. And with initial add on treatment, um, is either low dose of inhaled corticosteroids plus LABA or uh, leukotriene receptor antagonist. Then the step three, what the previously used to be, you consider additional controller therapies. And then step four and five were merged in the recent guidelines in 2019, where the patient should be referred to the specialist care at the time. And, and that's where all the additional treatment uh, sits in when they're referred to the specialist treatment, they follow the algorithm as shown by Eckhart earlier from the NICE algorithm, that first you confirm the diagnosis of asthma. Uh, once you have confirmed the diagnosis of an asthma, you look out, look for added comorbidities. And once you have ascertained any comorbidities are there, are the patient doing the inhale, are, is the adherence good? Are they taking the, treat, uh, uh, are they taking the treatment? And then you escalate treatment based on what, 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 what phenotype you think or what are what is the unmet need and i suspect here is where teotropium sits in um i think we um Eka, do you have anything more to add or should we take on the question and answers now yeah, I, I just want to add that I, I think this is an, at least it's a very intriguing or interesting approach that you guys do in the UK because uh, basically you, you you show here a guideline where you say the, the moment uh, it, it gets a bit complicated, you better refer to a specialist care and, and this is a black box <laughs> how, how this patient is then treated. And you don't show it in the guideline anymore, or in the algorithm at least, it's it's not shown anymore. So I think this is this is um, yeah, it's one way to to try to make sure that the, this patient group, what we are talking about, um, frequent exacerbations, um, yeah, loss of lung function, uh, really bad asthma control, are really getting treated by a specialist, but. Um, at least I, I want to ask you, do you have enough specialists around? Are these patients are really covered then by the specialists or is that a problem then? So I think um, it's, it's a chicken and egg situation, Eckhart. Uh, this has been recently been updated in the BTS guidelines because there was a concern that the patients on step four and five are being managed in, 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 in prime by non-specialist or in the primary care uh, some being on a high amount of treatment without going through the assessment or some even having a diagnosis of an asthma with it. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the definition of specialist, I am, um, I'm still not very clear uh, what classifies as a specialist uh, in, um, uh, for at least for pediatric or to young person's asthma, who is specialist, mm -hmm. am I specialist, who manages in, in, in a sit in a regional and tertiary center, or is, is a GP specialist who has done the courses and efficiency with it. And so it's, it's not very clearly defined what the specialist is. And I suspect uh, it, it would be, it, it would it be, I presume it will come soon that what the definition of is, the specialist is and what sort of level of treatment can you manage with level of specialism, providing training to the people so that, but currently I think these are included because the concerns of patients being managed on very high amount, high amount of doses by, by, by GP primary care and non-generalist. Mm. I see. Um, yeah, maybe I, I could just make my concluding remarks. So uh, looking at this uh, PDS guideline, we can, we can say for the, for the teotropium, um, if you have a patient uh, that that is not well controlled with this additional control of therapies that that are shown here for uh, step three, uh, and you still have um, exacerbations or low lung function, or you um, have all the signs of of, of uh, bad asthma control, you have 
reduced uh, daily activities, uh, nighttime awakenings or whatever. Uh, so to your job, you might be another controller um, that you can add and that you should that you should consider to add because um, because uh, it it looks like a, a very very safe drug uh, that has an impact on lung function um, as as I showed you. Thank you. And if I Thanks. just Thank add you. on to that, uh, Eckhart, that uh, I'm not sure why the, the, the evidence which you have shown was not um, reviewed in the last BTS guidelines published last year. I suspect it, it was published after the guidelines was reviewed. And, and, and the guidelines 2019 says that uh, there is no recommendation on the use of uh, cheotropium in children in either NICE or BTS sign guidelines. Um, so um, I think there are a few questions coming in. Uh, are you happy, Eckhart, to take the questions now? Yes. Yeah. How, uh, will, will you read them or shall I? Uh, can I read I'll, I'll read it to you. Um, oh, Abdullah great. is asking, uh, do you look at the asthma phenotype uh, uh, of the patients who it would be eligible or who are likely to benefit from geotropium. Yes, actually we did that. Uh, thanks, this is a, a very important question, of course. And we, um, I mean, the phenotype is of course, uh, yeah, we, we have limited uh, ways to look at it, but we, um, we uh, looked at the IgE levels, we looked at specific sensitization, and we looked at pheno, and we looked at uh, peripheral blood eosinophil uh, levels. And uh, basically, to make a long story short, there are no differences between these different groups uh, in terms of efficacy data for teotropium. So teotropium is not affected by um, the, the type of, of uh, non-allergic versus allergic or eosinophilic high-low um, endotype. Thank you. And I, th I think for practical, I think the patients which I have seen and found a benefit at card is are the, those ones who has got persistent bronchodilator response, and you know they are taking inhaled corticosteroids, you measured it either by directly observing it, and those are the group of patients when we have started teotropium, we have seen improvement in the symptoms, and you've seen improvement in the lung function test. So yeah, I fully agree. Um, Atul, this is, this is uh, one thing you, you can do, and maybe you should do, to look at the bronchodilator responsiveness and um, the likelihood that teotropium works in, in, in a patient uh, gets higher when you have high uh, responsiveness in the patient, yeah. And, um, the other is uh, from Adnan asking about the data for teotropium in six to 11 years is promising, but pragmatically, if we cho choose to use it, how long should this trial be? The, the trial uh, or, or how, to, how long should, should I use it? Yeah, how long would you use it to see the benefit? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, the, if it works, it works fast. So it's not, not a question like with a biological, like, like an anti-IG antibody that you need to wait from, for weeks or months until you get a result. So if it works, it works fast. And um, of course, how long should you use it? Uh, as in any step up treatment, you should use it for, um, I would say, at least three months and then see if you have a stabilized situation, if you have uh, improved lung function, if you have um, uh, good asthma control, and then you can consider if you if you go step down again. But I, I would not recommend to do this too early. I would um, really stabilize the patient and uh, the earliest after three and uh, normally after six months uh, trying to step down again and see what happens. And, and, and how quickly is the response in the asthma control from teotropium? Are you talking about weeks or months? Oh, I, I'm talking about weeks. weeks. The, the, if, if, if you have a responder and and um, then you will see a fast response to the to the drug absolutely and i thought the next one is more practical and licensing uh, question um, is this okay to use handy inhaler for teotropium for asthma as opposed to respimat 
the technique is sometimes can be difficult for the young children. Um, so uh, the, the teotropium is licensed with a respimat, right? So this is a different device, and this device goes with a with a spacer, so you can use it easily with a spacer in the in the patients who are not um, able to to use to use it directly, if you want. But I mean, this is it is licensed six years in the in the buff, so um, it, I, I think it's a very good device. It makes very small particle size. It has a very good bioactivity and bio. Uh, it reaches really low into the airways, um, so I think the device is is fine. Of course. To be honest, it is an I would say a disadvantage that that you if you have a combination of let's say ITS and lava and um, uh, teotropium, you then would have a second device in the hand. So this uh, needs to be considered. Thank you. Um, Suja is asking, um, would it be preferable to invest in identifying adherence and asthma education by close follow-up when assuring whether it is severe asthma? Yeah, absolutely. I think not only my talk, but, but the, the, the talks before made this very, very clear. I think uh, we, sh we should invest in, in uh, really follow-up studies. We need to study lung function data uh, earlier and more, closely, more closer. Uh, we need to get a better grip on biomarkers that that can predict severe asthma progression. <laughs> and um, oops, what was that? <laughs> and um, and we, um, I, I think uh, we we might consider investing money for this is is better than uh, investing so so much money for biologicals. But this is a political question. Thank you. And um, the, the, the side effects, you talked about the clinical trial side effects. Uh, practically in real life, when you have used it, do you see any side effects occurred from teotropium? And if, what are the common ones? Yeah, the, the common ones are a little bit of dry mouth. Um, this, is, this is one of the more common ones. And I think basically, we haven't seen uh, really um, uh, many side effects, so it's it's uh, it's really safe. So this is uh, this is the good uh, good news for for the pediatric uh, communities because this is is really not a harmful drug, and it I think it's a, it's easy to consider uh, to use it as a step up because uh, safety is not a concern. So. Um, prior to using biologicals, where you of course have uh, injections and and might have uh, safety considerations uh, among the parents, you can you can try this as a step before. Um, the, the, the dosing is different in in licensing by EMA and FDA. Why yeah. do you think the dosing is different? Um, by a different licensing authority for the same disease, for the same. Patient. Yeah, I, I think this is a this is a question that I'm uh, really hardly able to to answer. I'm I'm a bit astonished as well. I think I need to be now uh, yeah politically correct. Um, if I look at the data, there in in most of the the studies there is no difference between the two drugs uh, between the two dosages. Um, I showed you today the, the data from the pediatric severe asthma trial, and this is um, the one trial where we have a very nice uh, dose response curve with, with better responses for the five micrograms. And um, I think the FDA just um, out of a concern of side effects, or I, I don't know exactly why uh, they used uh, the, the, the lower dose, um, but um, the, the five microgram is definitely preferably for, for for in terms of efficacy. Thank you. Um, the the teotropium for the uh, preschool uh, wees. Uh, there is some data published, although it's not unlicensed. Do you want to mention about that data, Eckhart? Yeah, I can I can mention it. I'm I I'm not allowed to show the the slides because. It, as we said, it's not labeled, so you are not allowed to use it. 
um, there there was a, more like an um, ex, um, yeah, like like an investigative trial on on the on these toddlers, and um, a small number of patients, not really lung function data because they were too small. And uh, what what can be seen from this study is that um, side effects by asthma worsening or by by more frequent wheezing episodes were diminished. Uh, by using this theotropium in this age group, and I think definitely the the, the study was was published in Lancet Respiratory Medicine um, by Hans Biscard and colleagues, and I think it's a very thrilling uh, study because it's for this very difficult age group where we not have good good drugs available to to face the problems of the families. They have uh, yeah severe wheezes. They have um, a um, lot of uh, episodic days or nights, and uh, I think there's a the big unmet need in this age group for for new drugs or for better effective drugs. So I think at least the, the data from the study warrant uh, further investigation, and I really hope that uh, this would happen um, for the for the future. Yeah. And, and, and do you know, Eckhart, there is currently any study because that study was to look at the safety. Uh, profile any study look, taking it further to look at the efficacy so that it can be licensed in the preschool age group. Yeah, exactly. So as I said, this this is not a not a study who uh, was mentioned to give a label um, or a license. Um, basically, it showed that the safety was um, was not a problem or that we had no safety signals from the drug in this age group, um, but. Um, uh, then looking at the safety data, the the safety, uh, the, the 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 adverse e events by asthma were reduced in the group with tyrotropium. So this is basically the, the the main answer by that study. And I think it would be very nice to have a, a real efficacy study in this age group with this drug. There's still um, uh, thank you, Eckhart. There's still some questions about hand inhaler. And so, am I correct in understanding is that Respimet is only licensed for asthma, and and Handy Haler is is licensed for uh, COPD uh, at least. But in the pediatric age group, Respimet is the only licensed inhaler, and we have no other option. Is that correct? Yeah, that is correct. I, um, at least that is correct in Germany. I think the same is true for UK. Uh, so um, for for the asthma treatment, this uh, teratropium you uh, you you can only give it in form of uh, the respirate yeah. device. Yeah. yeah. Um, and and um, we coming up to. Um, but but as I said, I think the respirate is a is a really very good device for for treating. If you if you ever had it in hand, I think. It's it's easy to use and it it has a really really um, very favorable uh, particle size for asthma treatment. Yes, and I think Asthma UK has got some videos on how to use it, and it's very yeah I agree it is 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 easy to use device. Um, and and the uh, next question is from Noor. Uh, it seems to that the exposure to smoke antenatally and postnatally is a major risk factor for asthma, uh, COPD in early and late life. Do you think we are doing enough to help parents to stop smoking? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that is a good question. I mean, you know the numbers of smokers uh, around the world and in UK and in Germany and uh, where we are not. So um, the clear answer, I think, is no. We we are not doing enough. Um, I think one easy way to, yeah, to 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 help this problem is uh, would be at least this is for Germany to stop that uh, the state um, has taxes on on uh, tobacco smoke because this is uh, still then guaranteeing some income for the for the for the state and I think. Um, you should just ban completely ban tobacco smoke, and then uh, this this is the only chance we have um, that that it's not allowed anymore. Very easy. Yeah, yeah, and then and from the biopred data, uh, which I think was presented at ERS a couple of years ago, 
showed that in the preschool age group, the only factor differentiating between those being admitted to the intensive care unit and those who were admitted to the general wards were the parents who were either smoking inside or outside the house. Yeah. So a clear answer to that question was no, we are not doing that. <laughs> but, okay. Um, yeah, and then and then then there would be the question about the e-cigarettes, which um, um, what is there or not? And I think there is a very good oral presentation on that. If people wants to view that, uh, there are link being sent uh, across through the chat, or they are available on the app. Uh, and, and Professor Andrew Bush will be talking about the next talk after the break on the ESIC rates. Um, uh, and so we can we can talk, we can learn from him about ESIC rates and, and, and ask him uh, uh, how good or bad is for young children, is, is it? So uh, thank you very much, Eckhart, uh, for it. Uh, my apologies for all the technical problem, but I think it was a great data and, and I think the phone worked very well. Okay, thank you very uh, much, uh, Atul. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen and, and colleagues, and all the best to you guys over there in the UK. Thank and you. have a good day. Goodbye. Thank you.